button. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning for this session with Kyle as part of our accessibility webinar series. My name is Laura Luopa and I'm a librarian with eCampus Ontario and joining in today is Sarah, who is also a librarian with eCampus Ontario, and our presenter, Kyle Mackey. First, we'd like to acknowledge that the campus, the offices of eCampus Ontario are located in downtown Toronto and are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. I am joining this session today from Sudbury, which is on the traditional lands of the Anishabe people of Turtle Island, the Atikamishang, the Anishawabek, and I would also like to recognize the Wanapate First Nation and the Métis Nation of Ontario. Sarah has shared some links in the chat to land acknowledgements, and please feel free to take the opportunity to share your own in the chat as well. At this point, I'd like to pass it over to Kyle, who will be presenting today. Okay. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Um, and welcome, everyone. I um, It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, similarly to what Laura was saying, I'm coming from Guelph, Ontario, um, and Guelph sits on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe people specifically the traditional ter territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and Guelph is standing on the Between the Lakes Purchase Number 3 Treaty. Um, so um, acknowledging that and acknowledging you all for coming um, and joining me today. It's great to see so many people here. Um, I'm not sure what the protocols are for putting uh, your cameras on, but feel free to do that. I recognize a number of um, uh, connections in the participants list. So thanks for taking the time on a Tuesday morning um, to join me. I will share my screen right now. Um, that work, I hope. There we go. Um, and I'd like to also thank eCampus Ontario for putting on this uh, this webinar series. I had the opportunity to sit in on a um, one of these webinars last week on alt text. I found it very helpful. Um, the great thing that I found about these conversations is no matter where you're coming from in terms of your work in accessibility and your work in media, um, there's an opportunity to take something away. So I hope that's the case for today. Um, and um, on we will go. So I've got two things um, up on my screen. One is the slides from um, that you received a copy of. Now, while I was going through and putting together my notes for uh, the session today, I did switch the order of some of them. Um, so I'm confident and hopeful that you'll be able to, to follow along. Um, I just switched one or two. Um, but if not, by all means, stop me and I'll direct you to the appropriate slide. Um, I've also put together a, uh, a press book. OER for this session. Um, and maybe Laura or whoever's sharing links in the chat, you could put that into the, the chat. Um, it's called Writing Accessibility Statements for OERs. Um, this is um, kind of an expansion on what the slides are. So feel free, it's Creative Commons licensed. Um, download it, use it, share it with your friends, rip it apart, um, adopt it, adapt it, whatever makes sense for you. All right. So quickly uh, about me, like I said, I am in Guelph, Ontario. I'm an educational consultant. Um, I've been an independent educational consultant for over um, 10 years now. Um, and prior to that, I worked at the University of Guelph, leading up a team that did the design and development and support of the online courses for distance ed, continuing ed, the suite of eds. Um, I do a fair amount of work in instructional design and development. Uh, some research, some writing. I'm a big proponent of open education and open educational practices. Um, and I've done a fair amount of work in accessibility, both at my time 
during my time at the University of Guelph and uh, also as an independent um, consultant. So you can read all about me and see what I've done um, at kylemackey.ca. If you look for me on the internet, chances are good you'll find me. I'm not on Twitter slash X, but everywhere else you can likely find me. Um, how am I doing with my speed interpreters and translators? Let me know if I'm going too quickly, please. Okay, so um, a bit of an overview for today. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of accessibility statements. We're going to talk about some components of accessibility statements, uh, crafting clear accessibility statements, tools and approaches to putting them together. Um, we'll do a little bit of analysis and a hands-on activity. I'm hoping you'll participate with me. Um, and there'll be lots of time for open discussion at the end, questions, answers, um, and further conversations. All right, so I'm going to hop over to the press book right now. Um, and I'm going to jump in first. Actually, you don't need to know about this resource. You know why you're here. Um, but I'm going to jump to that first under the main body. What is an accessibility statement? Um, so let me just get rid of this because I'm blocking some of my screen. Um, I'm going to suggest that putting together an accessible piece of content, an accessible open educational resource takes a fair amount of work and is a significant accomplishment. Um, and then from there, because it is such a wonderful accomplishment, to enhance the usefulness of the resource, it's a good idea to consider putting an accessibility statement together. It may not be required in your specific case, but it is a really helpful addition to your resource. So in this press book and this presentation, a little bit of guidance and suggestions in how to put together this accessibility statement, focusing on what to include and how to put it together. What is an accessibility statement? So we have a common definition, um, a resource or point of reference for people who have questions about the accessibility of your resource. Plain and simple, I hope. Um, and to kick us off, a very brief and very incomplete history of accessibility statements. What year was the PAS 78 guide, the public available, publicly available specification guide 78, which provided the first official definition of an accessibility statement for websites published? What year? Anybody want to guess? Shout it out. Put in the chat. I can't see the chat. bringing up the chat, 1987, hmm? one more guess, 78, 78. You would think that maybe it would be 1978. Fact of the matter is it's 2006. Um, the Guide to Good Practice in Commissioning Accessible Websites is a publicly available specification published on March 8th, 2006. It just had its birthday by the British Standards Institution in collaboration with the Disability Rights Commission. You can keep that and share it amongst your friends as a little uh, a little game. So on we go. Um, let's talk about how accessibility statements are important. Um, this is a little interaction built in H5P. Um, and um, so there's a lot of conversation around accessibility statements. This is not the authoritative guide. I've tried to compile a lot of information. Um, some of you have contributed to that conversation as well. So thank you. So they speak to inclusion and equity. Uh, clearly articulated accessibility statement reflect a commitment to inclusion so that all learners have equal opportunities to engage with the resource. They speak to legal compliance. Um, so they may reference or build in elements of things like the AODA here in Ontario, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act, or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And in some situations, you may be required to provide an accessibility statement as part of your project or as part of your institution. Um, so they provide user guidance, right? some wayfinding um, pointers for people with um, disabilities on how to navigate and utilize your resource, information about alternative formats, how to access them, how to give feedback, that type of thing. They provide and lead to an enhanced user experience. 
Um, they contribute to a better user experience by communicating how resources are accessible, um, making this a accommodating and inclusive environment. They help build reputation and trust around the resource and also about the provider, the developer who's put together the, um, the OER. Um, they, and this is interesting, um, I was thinking about this a fair amount, they help promote proactive problem solving. So they encourage developers, content creators, authors to proactively address accessibility issues and build in systems of continuous improvement and responsiveness. And I will suggest it's a bit of a humble celebration. As I said at the beginning, accessibility work um, is work. Um, it takes planning, it takes care. And that's worth noting, communicating, and celebrating. So all that said, um, who are accessibility statements for? Right? So you're putting together this accessibility statement, and it's important to consider your audience, as with everything that we develop, because this understanding will help shape the way you put it together, what you include, and how you word it. So let's say broadly, um, and here's another interactive piece for you. Tell me who you should consider when you're putting together an accessibility statement. I've got the chat open. Or you could shout them out too. Unmute yourself. Individuals with disabilities, thank you very much. Give me a few more, folks. Thank you, Josie. And thank you, Josie, for your work that you've done in this. Uh, Very helpful in putting this together. Everyone, right. So um, I'm going to check all of them off because Laura knows where she's at. And you can go through and read these in your own version when you're accessing the OER. Um, but definitely, we need to consider um, that this accessibility statement being openly communicated will be referenced and used and people will find it helpful in a number of ways. Whether those people are policymakers, funders, researchers in accessibility might wanna use your resource as a case study. Legal professionals might look to um, examples of resources as they're putting together uh, their work, policymakers. The general public, and I think this is worth um, highlighting, by making your resource accessible, um, you, enhance a general understanding and appreciation of accessibility because the resource is accessible um, and also some communication in a clear way tells the general public that um, that this is important and this is how it can work. Project funders, um, educators and academic institutions and librarians will look to your resource and build that into their uh, curriculum or direct learners to it. Um, so all those things are arguably um, worth being considered. Um, but before we go much further, so Hassle Inclusion is a consultancy group out of the UK. Uh, they have a blog and a website. You can check them out. Um, one of their posts that is titled How to Write an, an Effective Accessibility Statement suggests that a lot of the accessibility statements out there um, showcase an organization's dedication to accessibility, but they and they may be filled with jargon, be it technical, legal, accessibility legislation. So as a result, these, um, these statements can be uh, a combination of a sales pitch on how socially responsible the organization is, a technology manual, and some legal small print. So, Let's consider that the folks that are going to seek out your accessibility statement when they're facing any difficulties or trying to figure out how to navigate your resource are folks with disabilities. And when they need to access that content and navigate your resource, it's timely, it's crucial. They might be um, a student who's completing an assignment or they might be a researcher who's trying to get um, access to the wonderful resource that you put together. So by providing clear, useful information to the reader um, and um, not making them wade through irrelevant technical information or technical details is helpful. So write with 
the actual user in mind. Um, they should be able to access this in an immediate way, give them straightforward, relevant information. All right, where are we at with this? That was the slide on who's your audience. Okay, so we're gonna move ahead to um, some examples. Um, and this is um, accessible in your, in your um, press book. Um, I've got a little exercise here that I hope you'll engage with. Um, the, the, the exercise is quite straightforward. I'd love you to go out and find a resource or a website um, either from the list that I provided or one of your own choosing. It might be something that you're working on or a page or a resource from your institution. Find the accessibility statement, review it. I put together a form on this page, which is built in Google Forms. It's not capturing any information from you, personal information. Um, you can use it or you can just make note of it. Um, it just walks through, you know, name, URL, and a couple other prompts that will be compiled and then you'll be able to see um, the answers from everybody else as well. So um, maybe we could take five, seven minutes to go out and find an accessibility statement. Um, I've got a number listed up here, the BC Campus Accessibility Toolkit, Government of Canada Accessibility Statement. Maybe uh, Laura, we could plop these into the, oh, there we are, into the chat as well. Um, there we go. Thanks very much. Uh, hassle inclusion, that's worth having a look at because um, they take a little bit of a different um, a different take on it. The Curious Educator's Guide to AI is a press book that was put together um, as a project with eCampus Ontario. There's a W3C link as well. Um, also, if anybody can find the eCampus Ontario accessibility statement, that might be relevant as well. All right, so you've got five minutes.
Okay, so we've got one more minute. Go. Really one real response, which is better than zero. Um, while we're wrapping up, if anybody has, um, if anybody wants to either put into the chat, any thoughts on that? Um, any thoughts on the examples or unmute yourself and chime in? Somebody put into the uh, Google form and thank you who did this. Um, looking at the, there we go. Looking at the open text accessibility statement. Um, I'll agree, really easy to find, really clear in terms of language. Um, it mentions specific accessibility features. Um, there's a feedback uh, link in terms of if people have comments or suggestions or questions. There is a continuous improvement built in um, and notes down here, some acknowledgement of the known issues and how they're trying to fix them. Let's have a look. Um, this is the BC Campus Accessibility Toolkit. Um, talks to other file files available known accessibility issues and areas for improvement. Um, if you're having problems accessing this toolkit. And um, yeah, that's definitely something that I looked at in terms of um, a, an exemplar of an accessibility statement. Um, so thanks to the folk at B, folks at BC campus for that. Somebody else looked at the um, accessibility statement and the government of Canada website. Um, which is under Accessibility Standards Canada. This is um, quite robust, I thought. It talks specifically to um, standards compliance, structural markup, ARIA landmarks. Um, so if you don't know what ARIA is all about, um, it's, um, well, there's an ex there's a, there's a definition right here, right? Um, it's about markup. It defines a way to make web content and web applications more accessible to people with disabilities. Information about images and links, forms, scripts, visual designs, accessibility tools, um, and then tell us how we're doing, right? Anybody else play along with this game? Let's have a look. Does anybody else wanna chime in and talk about their experience looking at accessibility statements? All right. Well, let's move along. We can always have time for some more conversation at the end. Um, so I put together some ideas based on looking at these as well as other examples of accessibility statements for OERs and web pages generally. I mean, we could also, you know, we could lump in web pages with this conversation. Um, many web pages are open educational resources. Many open educational resources are web pages. Um, so there's definitely some overlap and consideration there. Um, so this just talks to, um, you know, an overview of some of the core components that I noticed. Um, it may not be exhaustive for your specific example, but there tends to be a commitment to accessibility, some information about scope and coverage and conformance, a way for feedback to happen, perhaps some information about accessible alternatives, and then information about um, a review and update process. Sometimes there's um, uh, some information about the date of this uh, accessibility statement and when it's reviewed or the review cycle, which I think is, um, potentially quite helpful as well. Um, many of you looked at this. This is an accessibility statement um, from uh, the press book, A Curious Educator's Guide to AI. Um, that's something that I worked on with uh, my good friend, Aaron Aspen Leader down at McMaster. We put this together in the fall um, and um, so it has those standard features, and you'll see that I've linked out to um, the different guidelines 
embedded Aaron's email and uh, pointed to some best practices for the platforms that are there. Um, and we talked about that. So moving along here, a bit of a do's and don'ts, right? This is pretty straightforward stuff in your, um, hopefully straightforward stuff in your press book. I put together, you know, something that's a little bit straightforward as well, but it lets you click on things. Um, so we'll go through these very quickly, you know, clear and simple language for easy understanding, um, clearly outline available accessibility features, describe ways users can personalize their experience, like adjusting font sizes and browser settings, highlight compatibility with various technologies, be transparent about any limitations and how to improve them, right? Uh, provide accessible contact information for reporting issues and suggestions. That feedback is quite helpful. Um, keep it updated. Uh, actively seek out feedback. Don't treat it as just a mere formality or an underlying commitment, uh, or sorry, without underlying commitment. Um, don't copy and paste it, right? Um, because make it something that's specific to the resource and specific to the, the, the accessibility features of it. So showing a real commitment to inclusivity and accessibility. Um, detail your organization's adherence. Um, make sure that the accessibility itself, this the statement ex itself is accessible. Cater to di diverse accessibility needs. Um, explicitly state ongoing accessibility improvements. Provide specific examples. Include a section about how users can report technical issues effectively. Um, and make sure it's findable. And I think that's a key piece. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, um, finding an accessibility statement is important, right? In that um, Curious Educator's Guide, it is uh, chapter three. Um, in this guide that I put together, it is chapter two. Um, I guess the takeaway here is, um, for me, is don't hide it, right? It's not something that should be at the bottom of, you know, information about the funding and information about um, the learning outcomes, uh, down, down, down the list. And then, oh, by the way, this is something that is, this is how this is put together in an accessible way. Because again, going back to hassle inclusions guidance and some information about how important this thing is, um, it is something that should be readily available. I know that, um, you know, if it's part of a website, there are no doubt um, some guidelines at an institutional level in terms of where these statements can be, could be something that is in the running footer of the, the, um, the website. So um, make it easily accessible um, and make it easily findable. Um, my final piece here, my last word, say enough, but don't say too much. And this is worthy of some conversation as well, um, either now and definitely with your team um, that you work with at your institution. So um, as we looked at the Government of Canada um, statement, it's quite detailed, right? They've put in information about ARIA. They put in information about images. Um, they pulled information out, and they've also pointed to the different um, accessibility guidelines. If we look at something from the Curious Educator, then the accessibility statement, again, I've pointed out to the best practices for accessibility in press books and H5P and PDF. Um, I've linked to the different standards. So two potentially different approaches, and I see um, pros and cons of each. Um, if something like what we've got in the Curious Educator's Guide to AI, um, this is something that, you know, pointing to the, the authoritative source for the standards and the other information, the best practices, that will mean that those can be updated and the links are still accessible, right? They're, they're still valid. Whereas 
um, putting something together where we're pulling information out and putting it into the accessibility statement itself could lead to um, a bit of a sustainability um, issue for for you as a developer. And we wouldn't want to point um, or include incorrect information for the users. So um, it's something to consider. I don't think either way is right or wrong. Um, what it will mean in um, a case where you've got the curious educators where I'm pointing out, then it's an additional click, right? So then I've got to go to this page on Pressbooks Accessibility, and that may have a different navigation structure, probably will, and that will have a specific way of presenting content. I've got to find the specific information. Um, so some uh, some conversations to be had about that. Um, so we're about 25 minutes into uh, the webinar. I've got a um, a link to the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative Initiative Accessibility Statement Generator Tool. That's a mouthful, um, but this is, I think, helpful to have a look at. Where are we here? Oh, I missed one part of my presentation. Here we go. Um, more on that later. The um, W3C, if you um, are familiar with the W3C, they are the World Wide Web Consortium. So they develop standards and guidelines to help everyone build web page, a web based, a, a web based on the principles of accessibility, internationalization, privacy, and security. Um, and they have put together a accessibility statement generator, um, which you can explore. Uh, it's quite flexible. Um, I like um, how they've broken it down into basic information, your efforts, technical information, approval and complaints process. Um, so you fill out the form, um, you can customize it by adding different fields, and then it creates a statement for you. That's the point where you take that statement and you start to figure out what how you need to customize it even further. So this, I think, is a good first step. Um, and then you weigh in with um, your specific needs and um, and put that into the appropriate places. Speaking of the appropriate places, um, as I was putting together this um, this press book, you'll see that I have H5P things embedded as well. Um, as I was putting together the book, I thought, so where do I put in information about how this is accessible. Is there a standard place in the press book um, where, along with all the information about you know the 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 discipline, the all the all the metadata, is there a place where I could put in information about accessibility? And there's not um, in terms of those you know the administration, the book information fields. Um, I've reached out to Steele at Pressbooks um, and we've got a conversation ongoing. I think it would be great um, if there was a way to, you know, at the bottom of every page, if there was a way to have some accessibility information or if there was a way to catalog um, in Pressbooks, have that as piece of the, as, as a piece of the information available. Um, because, um, from a personal uh, perspective, I worked on a project not too long ago with eCampus Ontario, um, where we were looking at business related OERs um, with the idea that these could be used, promoted to be used widely in Ontario and beyond for first year business. Um, we put together a bit of a scoring card um, so that we could rate you know, their breadth and depth um, and their interactivity and those type of things. And one of the criteria was whether it was accessible. Um, we went through a number of different um, databases. Some OERs had an accessibility statement, some did not. Um, it would be great if, you know, in Pressbooks, if there was a common place that was something that people were um, uh, were encouraged to use, that you could search by um, whether it has an accessibility statement, what the criteria are, that type of thing. Similarly, in um, H5P, one of the conversations I had with um, the folks there was 
is there a way that we could include accessibility information in um, the metadata for the H5P? Um, I've kind of done a bit of a workaround here. If you click on any of the H5P um, interactions that I've built in down at the bottom, coupled with the licensing, um, the metadata, I've put in links to, well, they're not links because that doesn't work um, in the metadata, but I put in the text for links for information about the accessibility of H5P. Um, the conversation I had with the folks there, Oliver, um, was that it could be helpful if there was specific accessibility considerations for this specific interactivity type, that it could link directly to that, as well as information about um, that I could put in about what I've done to make this generally accessible. So again, when we talk about location, 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 and those are the slides that I've put up here um, and in your handout, then um, you can't really see, read them very well, but that's what I'm talking about here. Places for us to include accessible information and links to the efforts that we've made to make it thus. There's a couple other accessibility statement generators that I've come upon. Um, the W3C one is the first link. I think it's the most um, easy to use. There's one from Accessible Web and one from Nomensa. Those are both consulting companies um, and they have something on their website as a, a generator. So how's everybody doing? Oh, I've got a, in the chat here. Oh, in the H5P studio, perhaps indicating the known accessible content types. Yeah, I thought that's what I included, um, Holly, but I might not be. This was a last minute. Yeah, these content types of recommendations. I think that gets you there as well. Um, oh, yes. Thanks, Holly. Okay, so that's all the info, all the kind of slides and um, show and tell of the press book. I would love folks to um, to chime in. Here's what you could do um, if you want to advance those conversations around um, press books and H5P accessibility statements. Um, if you are a member, if you have an account on h5p.org in their forum. I've posted something um, and you could upvote that or what have you. Um, you could reach out to Pressbooks and say, hey, Steele, um, I just had in a, com a conversation webinar with Kyle Mackey and he'll say, oh, yeah, that guy. And um, you'll say, I think that was a really good idea. It is something that so I also posted something to LinkedIn and he responded to it. So they're, he, he, they are quite responsive, both of them. Um, they just need to figure out a way to do it within the scope of their platforms and whether it makes sense and all those things. So, um, so yes. So we will open it up to conversations, arguments, um, further considerations. Hey Kyle, it's Laura. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we do have a question that was in the question and answer uh, portal. Would you like me to 